Okay. Oh, I should put this down. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Food in the Garden. For those of you who are still in the garden, come on down. We're going to start our panel discussion with our illustrious group here to talk about the history of garden design. Tonight, we are wrapping up the third year of our partnership with Smithsonian Gardens and the National Museum of American History out here for our Food in the Garden program. I'm Susan Evans McClure, and I'm the program director for Smithsonian Food History. And this year at the museum is our year of innovation. So for Food in the Garden, we will be exploring innovations in food and gardens. With this fabulous panel and the amazing garden behind us, can we take a moment to thank Smithsonian Gardens for what they have created out here? Thank you. And you will all hear shortly who is responsible for this. Um, and if you like tonight, we encourage you to come back for more nights of smart happy hours with our American History After Hours series. We now have a seasoned pass. Get it? Seasoned pass? Yeah? Ticket? No? Okay. Um, and that is on sale, and it gets you six, uh, to, into six of our events, and it is an incredible deal, and its information is in your program and on our website. And uh, if you love and food and history, which obviously you do because you're here, uh, we also invite you to come back for our first annual Food History Weekend that is coming up October 22nd through the 24th. So tonight is a totally relaxed evening, and if you need to get up to get that second cocktail, please do come back and join us. The panel will talk here for about 20 minutes, and then we will open it up for a discussion, so have those questions ready. And then after the panel, because we know we are not going to cover 200 years of garden history in 20 minutes, we encourage you to come up and talk with our panel and ask more questions. And of course, it is completely socially acceptable to have your phones out because you are tweeting with the hashtag food in the garden, telling all of your friends what a fabulous time you're having. <laughs> um, a very special thank you to all of our donors who make this evening possible. Uh, we want to thank the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts and Wegmans. They are great partners who support our efforts to have conversations about how Americans understand themselves through our shared food history. Thank you also to Green Hat Gin and New Columbia Distillers for these delicious cocktails and to New Belgium Brewing Company for the craft beers. I also want to thank our chef this evening, William Bednar, who has outdone himself with a lovely plate of food and also a sausage and raclette table that was a real surprise to all of us that we love. So that is great. And a huge thank you to our team who makes all of this magic happen out here in our garden. You can stop any of us. You'll see people wearing aprons and ask all sorts of questions. So now, um, because this is the real attraction, I am going to turn this over to Cindy Brown, who is the man manager of the horticulture collection and education manager at Smithsonian Gardens. And she is our moderator for the evening. So take it away, Cindy. Thank you very much, Susan. We're very happy to be here. And I would like to thank our guests on our panel this evening, Dean Norton from Mount Vernon, who Dean, he's not quite as old as George Washington, but I think he knows about as much about gardens that George did, so he's going to enlighten us. And Sabina is here from, Sabina O'Hara is here from UDC. She is the new Dean of the Agriculture Economic College at UDC, which is a land grant university. So in case you didn't know, we do have a land grant right here in, in Washington, DC. And for Joe Brunetti, Joe is the wonderful gardener that tends this terrific space that's behind us, the Victory Garden, as well as many of the other spaces around American history. And he shares this spot with Aaron Clark, and Aaron's over in the marketplace. And the two of them, plus the interns that we have come every year, do a fabulous job of bringing these gardens to life and educate people about food and history. So, where are we gonna start? You're looking at us, me. Really. I know, that's me, that's <laughs> my job, right? Okay, so. We have three very different gardens, gardeners here on the panel, and I'd like to ask you, each of these gardens or garden types are based on the desire for self-sufficiency, at least in my viewpoint. We want or need to be able to provide for ourselves. How sustainable are the actual designs compared to the concepts for each of these gardens? 
Did George Washington really grow enough to feed his family and staff and the slaves that were at Mount Vernon? Did the Victory Gardens really make a difference in our food supplies? And are rooftop gardens really the answers to our food deserts in urban areas? So who wants to jump in? Well, I have the oldest site, so... Okay, um, uh, we'll defer to age. Just... <laughs> okay. Um, Washington, uh, the earliest gardens were based on survival. Uh, the first gardens were what they call gardens of necessity, and they were necessary for survival and health. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first laws passed in, um, at the settlement of Jamestown. We do have extra sound effects that really make the like panel it. discussion like go better. I hope we're not double parked out there. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, it was that once you've cultivated a space for vegetables, it must be fenced. Uh, because Americans very early on got the um, label of kind of lazy. Um, they planted, but they wanted to go out and dig for gold and look for treasures and other things like that. So one of the first laws was surround your fence. Uh, Washington's first garden was a kitchen garden laid in 1760. That space never changed over his lifetime. And uh, he was trying to grow food for his, not only his family, but also upwards of 600 guests a year. He did not grow vegetables for the slaves. They had their own gardens, they had their own poultry yards. Uh, but was, what was interesting is sometimes he had some uh, vegetable failures and they didn't, and they were bartering and trading and buying. And so it's an interesting exchange that went on. Mm -hmm. So not only were there vegetables in the kitchen garden, there were vegetables in his ple pleasure garden, vegetables in his fruit garden and nursery, and vegetables planted out in his cultivated fields. Because one garden, an acre in size, would feed upward to 14 to 18 people and require one full-time gardener. That's not bad, but he was trying to feed 600 people. So right, lots of everywhere. guests. Right. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right, well, we're going to jump over to the Victory Garden then, because you're the next oldest. Right, so I'll He's take you guys right up the timeline all the way to the 1940s. And can you all hear me okay? Sounds good. Um, so Victory Gardens were very sustainable during the war, and they absolutely made um, a huge impact on our food supply. Um, they proved themselves to be sustainable during the war uh, years, by increasing in numbers each consecutive year. And during the height of Victory Gardens, we had about 20 million in cultivation, and we were producing 40% of the produce that we consumed in America. Uh, it's just a staggering, staggering percentage. And that 40 percentage actually equaled 8 million tons of food. So you can just imagine the impact that must have had on the food that freed up that we were then able to ship overseas to our troops and allies uh, especially when all of their farms, or most of their farms and gardens, were getting bombed and destroyed by the night raids. Uh, so we really had to step up our game. And I will throw out a couple staggering statistics that were released by the USDA towards the, the end of Victory Gardens, proving how successful and how productive these were. Uh, and it goes like this. They said that enough eggs were produced when laid end to end to reach the moon seven times. Hmm. Enough milk was produced to float the navies of the United Nations. Enough meat to pave an eight-lane superhighway from New York to San Francisco at one inch thick. Uh, enough canned tomatoes to reach from Boston to Bombay, India, and enough corn that would equal the area of Japan proper. I think that's a new song. <laughs> <laughs> so highly, highly successful, highly productive. Um, so I would yeah. say they were sustainable a whole different side of that story that I'm not going to get into. After the war, not so sustainable, but the whole concept and the, the designs of the Victory Garden are certainly sustainable. And Sabina, you don't know, she's all an agriculture economist, economist, I say that backwards. You can really tell us if it's sustainable. Well, I want to put things a little bit in, in a context okay. of today um, and uh, how we are bringing this idea of urban agriculture and urban sustainability into today's Washington DC communities. Mm -hmm. um, so th the name of the college is actually College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environment Sciences, CAUSES. And we do have a cause, okay? Because really the urban ag and the urban sustainability have to hang together. Um, so urban food production, we look at that as part of an integrative urban food system that consists of producing the food, preparing the food and using that as a vehicle 
uh, both to add value, but also to um, uh, really expand nutrition education, particularly in our food desert neighborhoods. Um, food distribution, innovative markets, both farmers markets, which are, you know, in this country still relatively new, mm -hmm. um, but also community supported agriculture, sort of sharing models, um, co-op type models, direct marketing contracts, using ethnic foods, which is USDA speak for foods that are not native to the Americas, and we specialize particularly in African and Asian crops, because we have a very diverse community here in Washington, D.C., and people love food from where they're at home, and that tastes like home, right? These are niche markets that are very much economically viable. And then the fourth component is closing the loop through waste and water management. The last thing we want to be known for is to implement high intensity, high productivity urban food gardens that add to the algae bloom in the Chesapeake Bay because we've got nutrient runoff and so forth, right? So we've got to capture the water. We've got to reuse, reuse as much of it as possible. Um, and the same with composting, enhancing urban soils. So part of that really goes back to the traditional methods that both of you described, right? Biointensive systems, you know, uh, for example, when did we invent gardens in neat rows? Well, when we started having tractors. Right. Turns out that hexagon hexagons and so forth are much more intensive and create much more yields. Um, so in some of our urban neighborhoods, that's viable. But in some of our urban neighborhoods, there are soil contamination issues. So then that biointensive system might become an aquaponic system, where you use hot tub sized fish tanks to raise tilapia, use the fish excrement as fertilizer for the plants, and you close the loop, mm -hmm. right? And in some neighborhoods, like on our main campus at Van Ness, co corner of Van Ness and Connecticut, where there is a constant traffic jam most days, the only place to really do urban food production is on the roof. So we went six stories up on one of our buildings and a few months ago cut the ribbon on what we think is the largest food producing roof on the East Coast at least, 20,000 square feet, if you can imagine that. And it's all hand labor because you can't get a tractor up there. So um, raised bed gardens, the other interesting thing we think uh, and, and maybe pioneering because you're asking about innovation. This is a retrofitted roof on one of our campus buildings. And so this is no small undertaking to actually figure out where the weight bearing loads can be distributed so you can actually grow meaningful amounts of food up there. And we're doing it. That's great. Well, I, when you said composting, you know, you think of that as an innovation in the past 20, 30 years. But I know Dean knows a lot about composting because George did a little bit of that. Yeah, he, um, he kept diaries. We have seven volumes of diaries, 35 volumes of writings. And um, he saw compost and manure as a salvation of his agricultural fields. Um, stables were always located next to your kitchen gardens. That goes back to like the 13th century because that's your source of fertilizer. Manure out, manure in. But although they recognize that fresh manure may burn or kill, so they put it across the road. At Washington did in the Dung Repository, which has become a highlight of many people's yeah. visits to Mount Vernon. Um, Washington really talked often about his defective education, um, and so he studied. He was self-taught and read all sorts of agricultural books, and he sought the best experts that he could in whatever field he was trying to learn. And he wrote to Arthur Young, who was a famous agronomist in England. He said, I'm looking for a land manager that's Midas like, that whatever he Touches will turn to manure, the first transmutation to gold. <laughs> That's how important it was to him. It is. How about Victory Gardens? Did they think about organic ways or were they more innovative um, for innovation? During the war, they were using compost and manure quite a bit. Um, you know, they used what was at hand and what they had available to them. So if you were lucky enough to be a rural gardener and you had a stable in the backyard, uh, horse manure, perfect. Uh, they were using that quite a bit. And they really got into uh, talking about how to use hotbeds to get uh, your crops out earlier in the season so you can get an earlier harvest. And one technique they were explaining to a lot of people was to uh, put about a six inch layer of compost. Uh, fresh compost was fine, but you let it sit there and mellow out and it actually starts to heat up and create its own heat. And then you would then put your plants in there and they would, you would have uh, on these hotbeds a glass window, most likely that would close down on an angle, southern exposure, 
and then you have probably an 80 degree environment where your tomato plants are um, getting an early jump when it might be only 60 degrees outside. So now after the war, uh, it did transfer massively over to synthetic fertilizers because there was this mass amount of, of chemicals and elements that we had from the war that we didn't need anymore, so we started to transform them into uh, different pesticides, different types of, uh, like I said, synthetic fertilizers. Uh, so it was a, there was a major change in that, and then that really launched the, the Green Revolution, which is um, a whole other innovation story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're talking about innovations, but and compost definitely has a lasting impact, whether you're composting or, or using it. But what do you think is the most lasting innovation of your different gardens? Well, I think on the roof garden, ours is um, pretty high, about six stories. Um, uh, the design is, I think, certainly innovative, and we hope that uh, people will want to come and see it and see how they might retrofit their own flat roofs on very large buildings, very large expanses. Um, that's not sort of a trivial undertaking, of course. Then you have engineered soil up mm -hmm. there, like I in many rooftop yeah, gardens, so that brings in a whole other set of, of challenges. You want the engineered soil, it's lower in organic content, which retains less water, and that's of course what you want because you don't want all that weight up on your roof. Um, but the downside is that you have to irrigate. And so we're also demonstrating drip irrigation systems that are on a timer if you don't want to go out there watering all the time. And it turns out some of that drip irrigation that actually administers the water at the root zone level or just above is um, also a big water saving device. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, last I checked, many places in the country now we're running out of water. Um, um, I think the other aspect that, you know, not food, but I do want to bring in an, another aspect, and that is um, when we look at urban areas as places where we can grow meaning mount, meaningful amounts of food, um, we're improving the nutritional health because food that is locally grown and organically grown is different than most of the food um, that we find at our standard supermarkets. 80% of the produce in this country is grown in California. Not only is California running out of water, but we know that when you transport a tomato straight across from the West Coast, that cannot possibly have been harvested at Nutrient Peak because then it would be kind of soft. And so it needs to be harvested when it's hard like a baseball, right, to come clear across the country. Well, that really has nutritional implications. And so um, this more distributed, this vision of a more distributed local food system that really takes urban spaces as a serious partner in producing uh, local foods. Um, I think it has health implications. It also has larger implications in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and so forth. 25% uh, 20 per, of greenhouse gas emissions globally are attributable to food transportation. That's wow. a lot. That's a lot. Okay, That's so if we can lot. cut that down just a bit, I think that would be beneficial. Yeah. Dean, what do you think Mount Vernon, George Washington? Well, what's innovative about our garden is that I'm holding uh, Philip Miller's gardener's calendar from 1775. Gardening hasn't changed, folks. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do it. I'm uh, February in the kitchen garden. First of all, the uh, title page, uh, the gardener's calendar directing the necessary works to be done every month in the kitchen, fruit, and pleasure garden, also conservatory and nursery. Um, I love the February entry. If the weather proves mild in this month, there's a great deal of busyness to be done in the kitchen garden. Um, what people leave Mount Vernon realizing is anybody can do it. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, it's not hard. We fail. You know what? I give lectures, and they, the, the part they love the most is when I killed 3,000 boxwood in three months. <laughs> they think that's the greatest thing. If I can kill them, they can too. So um, it's not hard. In Washington, and the other founding fathers, he's in New York Harbor, 1776. He's watched 400 naval ships dock in New York Harbor. All of them have men in cannon to destroy him. He's riding back to Lund, Washington, his land manager. He says that they haven't moved on us by now is incomprehensible to me. We figure there's 30,000 on the low side, 33,000 on the high, with an additional 6,000 hessian yet to arrive. If you can find good honey locust seed, I think it'd make a great hedge. They were always at home. Yeah. That's where they wanted to be, in their cultivated fields and their cultivated gardens. 
get out, work in the dirt. It's so therapeutic. And it, it just plants something, anything. It's fun. It's easy. Don't make it complicated. I agree with that. We're, I'm getting the sign that we're five minutes to go. So I want to make sure we hit on a couple other things. And one of them is um, sometimes a garden story doesn't match reality. We always have these myths that surround our gardens. What do you think that we know about your gardens, or we think we know about your gardens, that really isn't true? Um, are the implied gardeners different from the real gardeners? Are the crops that you grew really the crops that were grown back in the time? So I'll let you. I would say one of the big misconceptions with Vic Victory Gardens is that they were all beginner gardeners. Yeah. And with urbanites, that uh, may be true. Most of them were probably beginners. But with a lot of the rural folk, they've been gardening for generations and generations. So um, becoming self-sufficient was nothing new to them. And another uh, interesting fact that not many people know about was the Secretary of Agriculture at that time, Claude Wickard. Uh, in the beginning, he did not receive the idea of Victory Gardens with open arms. He was actually slightly against it. And the reason for that was he uh, was discouraging inexperienced gardeners from planting a new vegetable plot. And the main reason for that was because he said that they were notoriously wasteful of seed, fertilizer, and pesticides, because mm -hmm. they didn't know what they were doing. Hmm. And one thing you don't want to do during war is be wasteful with anything. Um, he did say that he wanted to leave it up to all of the professionals. But guess what? Most of the professional farmers that we had were off fighting the war. So we really needed the homeowners in the Victory Gardens to step up and do their part. And to just back the Secretary of Agriculture, he did uh, fully come on board with Victory Gardens when he realized that we had massive food shortages and that the amount of production coming out of it was working. Mm -hmm. And it did work. Mm -hmm. How about Mount Vernon? Did George really do all that gardening by himself? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> he, um, he was uh, not a, a gardener. He was a designer for a year and a half, and then he's... He hired professional gardeners, and he went back to farming. And I mean, when he lived, he lived there for 45 years, and 16 of the years plus were away from his home. So he, he needed to create a landscape that was fitting to the man that he had become after winning our independence from the British Empire. Um, and, and his first gardeners, all he was looking for was a good kitchen gardener. But as his gardens developed, he was looking for a gardener that was competent in all phases of gardening, kitchen, pleasure, conservatory, and hothouses. So I guess I'd answer your question. Yeah, you answered the question. Thanks. <laughs> Sabine, I have a very uh, different but important question for you because we were talking about it earlier. What's the next innovation in edible gardens? We have all this, this history behind us. And it's not the first time that uh, edible rooftops have been created. Uh, Joe has uh, uh, found that they did rooftop gardens for Victory Gardens. So what is the next big thing that we're going to be looking at? So we're looking at uh, gardening methods, food production methods that actually don't use soil at all. Um, in urban areas, often the soil is compacted or it's even contaminated. And so even with composting and so forth, you may not get it to a place where you can actually grow food. Um, so we're looking also at hydroponics and aquaponics methods where we're using uh, very closed loop systems, very integrative systems to grow food um, sustainably, but also in, in intense quantities. Um, we have miniaturized some of our fish systems because again, urban, uh, no place to put swimming pool size fish tanks here anywhere. So ours are hot tub size but they're very highly intensive systems. So I hope um, you all will want to come either to uh, the campus at Van Ness or out to our urban agricultural experiment station in Beltsville. That'd be great. And one thing that we wanted to tell you all, because we want to leave something that you can take home, something that you've learned from us today that you can take home. And Dean, I think you said it best. Just go out and get dirty. Just go out and play and see what sprouts, see what you can cultivate, because we have killed way more plants than we have ever grown in our lives as horticulturists. So you try it too, <laughs> see what happens. But we'll be here to answer questions. We're gonna move over to the marketplace. Joe is going to, oh, questions. I forgot about questions. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get you into the garden so you can play. No questions.
uh, I just went to Mount Vernon last weekend. Thank you. And I talked to <laughs> Did you buy lots of souvenirs and stuff? <laughs> yes. Keep me employed. I, mean, yeah. I talked to one of your uh, interpreters uh, specifically about the garden, wow. and he said that, uh, in costume, said that uh, George Washington himself wasn't the gardener, but he did have his own plot. And he did. Mm -hmm. He um, specifically experimented with grasses because he thought that that was what was needed because it was practical to feed cattle. And he contrasted him with Thomas Jefferson, who was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's the dirty Take word. Take the mic away from him. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought maybe you might like to comment on that, and apparently you do. Well, he had, he had a, his own garden. He fondly called it his little garden. It's the botanic garden. It's right near the house. Uh, very small. Most people miss it when they come to Mount Vernon. But he kept real detailed records um, on what he did there, so it was very easy for us to um, recreate that accurately. There really weren't that many grasses in there, but down in the nursery there were. He was experimenting all the time, and one of the greatest gifts you could give him was a plant he didn't have. And uh, the botanical garden was where he liked to experiment with that. He was looking for plants that were Virginia-proof that could survive the harshness of the winter and the harshness of the summer, aren't we all? So, um, so yeah, he, he, he I'm gonna hate to say this, Jefferson was a gardener and he had a gardening book. Washington was a farmer. And um, one of the greatest lines he said was that, uh, nothing in my opinion would contribute more to the welfare of these states than the proper management of our lands. Mm -hmm. Continuing on to say, nothing in my opinion, or, um, and in this state, at least, l nothing is least understood. So he saw the, c the gentleman farmer just totally doing it wrong. And you'll never guess where he looked to find the way to do it right, England, because he knew they were landlocked. They had to have figured it out. So he went to those experts, agriculturalists, agronomists, and um, his seven-year crop rotation, I'm done, just a, his okay. seven-year crop rotation, only two of those years did he actually get any money from it. The, the other five were trying to improve the health of his fields. Pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Any, other, any other questions? So the Victory Gardens was a government program, but I can't believe that. I mean, I find, is that they were successful because it was the first time gardens were tallied and there was a census of gardens due to the war, I would think there'd be a whole array of amateur gardens that weren't counted before the World War II and were needed because there was the Great Recession, Depression. So I, I'm, I'm puzzled why we think, oh, it's the Victory Garden when everyone started to garden. I would think there would be a huge gardening, urban gardening community prior to the institutionalization of urban gardens. And I'm just wondering, is my hunch kind of on the mark or, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, when you look at World War I, they were called war gardens, and there's quite a bit of information out, out there about them being extremely successful. Um, it's harder to find all those statistics uh, during World War I. And then during the um, Great Depression, they were mostly, mostly known as relief gardens. Um, and they were very successful too, and people were becoming extremely self-sufficient. Uh, so they deserve as much credit as Victory Gardens do during World War II. Um, I think with all the stats coming out with World War II is that we really amped the advertising um, to really get people uh, motivated to plant these gardens. So with it advertising and with a lot of the log keeping, um, I, I think that's the reason that you're hearing about them a lot more. And also realize that Sabina and I were talking about this ahead of time. Anytime there's a um, recession, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of recessions in our history from the creation of our government, that's when they really looked to be more self-sustaining mm -hmm. and had more food gardens. So you had the Great Recession of 1887. I mean, they did a lot. You had the times when the conditions were so bad in the city, the wealthy people were looking to be able to make it healthier for their, their inhabitants, so they created gardens. So yes, there was a great garden movement. It's just that every <coughs> couple years, there's a new name, a new push, a new idea. We have to sell those books. Um, to be able to to put a name on it. But yes, we've gardened since almost the creation. That's why you need to go in and see the exhibit. Mm 
I think, uh, I guess I'm going to address this question, well, I guess to everybody. Um, so in, it, but I guess specifically to Sabina, because you're, you're talking about sort of the urban, urban farming aspect. I know that um, in the San Francisco Bay Area in California and West Oakland, they had a major soil remediation effort um, because a lot of the underserved communities there had very lead contaminated soil and they brought in tons of essentially fishbone meal. Um, to pull the lead out. I'm curious if that's something like that is is part of the program that you do or or you know is it a cost issue? Because um, you know you you also mentioned the uh, aquaponics and hydroponics and that also seems to be sort of a resource intensive yeah. you know solution. So just cur yeah. curious. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah. So we're actually in the process of uh, creating a soil map, uh, GPS based, right, where we could show areas that would be sort of red alert, uh, cautious with food production. Um, we also have an environmental testing lab on campus. Uh, some of you may have already contributed soil sample for our labor intensive process of becoming EPA certified for the soil testing lab. Um, but you know that again is a resource to try and address some of the questions you raised. In some cases um, the contamination is, is such that you can remediate with compost. We're also doing some tests right now, uh, primarily focused on um, arsenic and what plants are conducive to reducing arsenic contamination. So stay tuned uh, for those research results. Um, but you know, there will be areas where it's cost prohibitive. And, you know, um, aquaponics is certainly more resource intensive because now you're getting into a bit complex systems of how do you convert the, you know, the fertilizer into actually plant available forms of nitrogen, phosphorus and so forth. And that's a bit more complicated, but it turns out that some of the hydroponic methods you can actually do quite well on a, on a fairly low budget. Um, and you don't have to go online or to the fancy store to order all that stuff. <laughs> you can actually go to your local hardware store and buy PVC pipe PC, and, and, and you know, use materials that are very easily accessible and that you can do on a low budget. And so that's one of the things we, we teach as well. Um, how do you do it on a budget? Because if we really want to make a dent into you know, this um, sustainability thing, which has both economic and social and environmental aspects to it, then we need to be cognizant of that. How do you make these systems? And that's why we also make the distinction, you know, we, we completely affirm gardening, but we do make the distinction between gardening and agriculture. And what I'm talking about is urban agriculture. And that means systems that are more than an income supplement but systems that can actually be commercially viable in an urban setting. For one last short question. I see it over there. Okay. Thank you for raising your hand. You go. Good evening. Um, I, my uh, question is about uh, GMO. That seems to be a real big hot topic these days. Uh, I grew up on a farm where my father and we've talked about that everything has been genetically modified, really, and you really can't get seeds or plants that are true from back in Washington times. Is that true? Is there any benefit or non-benefit to genetically modified being uh, health or uh, nutrient value? I will, I'm not a GMO specialist, but I will only tell you, you can buy seed that has not been genetically modified. We do it all the time. So there are plenty of seed vendors, seed vendors that are out there that you can buy, but I'm not going to touch anything else. <laughs> I don't know if you'd like to. No, I mean, heirloom seed is a big deal for us. Yes. And it, it used to be really hard to find these things. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they're just so popular that it's very easy to find. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to take us a year to research to try to maybe recreate a garden, and now you can do it in three days. I mean, we go in the basement of some big mansion and we're given one book and a pencil and paper. We'd read the whole book and get one line that was pertinent to what we were trying to do. You can read, every book is now digitized and it's just not fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'd have to just 
quickly add to that that um, that's a, a massive topic of discussion, but you can get into uh, plants cross pollinating, you can get into plants hybridizing, and then you have GMOs, um, you have selections or um, yep offspurts and mutations. So there's a lot of variation going in there, and not just all being GMO because something is crossed. And I do I do want to uh, raise one issue, not not uh, GMOs particularly, but we will need to do more research on how to adapt plants that thrive in different urban settings. Sometimes you have shading issues, so the photosynthesis is reduced because you have northern exposures, you are in narrow alleys between buildings. We're finding that on the roof, you know, um, the light exposure, the heat exposure is more intense than on the ground, but so is the exposure to precipitation and wind. And so it's not as simple as saying, oh, we're just going to move south and take seeds from southern climes and bring them up here because you're kind of getting hit on both ends, right? So this will be really interesting, I think, as this urban ag thing evolves more to see how do we need to adapt some of the plants to really thrive in these different conditions. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you want to wrap it up? Sure. Thank you very much, Dean, Sabina, and Joe. We really appreciate it. We have really just started to plant ideas in people's minds. So go out and cultivate more and see what you can come up with yourself. But Dean is right. The best way to do it is just go get your hands dirty and try because it's fun. So Joe will be here to answer questions, give tours. Dean and Sabina will be here. I'll be over to talk about our greatest project called Community of Gardens, where we're collecting more stories about gardens, how they've made a difference in your life, how green spaces have increased your health. So I'd love to talk to you more about that. But give us a chance to get a drink, and then we'll be available to you. <laughs> edible wall and edible wall gardens over there, too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.